Member of Parliament for the National Democratic Congress, a former General Secretary of the People's National Convention. It should be well understood that when Parliament approves a qualified citizen to be a Justice of the Superior Courts, first one to Article 1284, the representatives of this country have appreciated the ability of that qualified person to contribute to justice delivery in the country. Second, the subject matter of this suit before this court is a constitutional dispute and not a matter involving political parties. The objection is therefore misconceived. Move your application and dismissed. We have before the courts an application bringing the courts by order vacating. So sorry, can you do it in 10 minutes? No, I'll try it. The order of the court dated the 18th of October 2024 and setting aside the processes of proceedings in the court leading to the order. We have set out the grounds on the face of the motion paper. There are eight of them. Now deal with the first ground. The first ground is that the writ or the processes on the basis of which the court's jurisdiction was invoked for the order are void because they were filed in violation of the rules of the court. The rules of the court are within the cognizance of the court, so I will not um, belabor them. But it's important to state right from the outset that they concede the, the fact that the processes were filed contrary to the rules of the court. But all they are saying in the affidavit of the position is that the court is capable of caring, not by reference to Rule 79 of the rules of the court, but of Court 81 of the High Court rules. But Lord, we are saying that that irregularity is incurable, and this court has re emphasized that in very recent cases in this court. My Lord, I refer just to two cases the case of Mahama Yarga, an attorney general, rates number one, J1 slash 13 slash 2022 dated 29th March 2022 there's also the case of Ken Crunchy versus Attorney General rate number J1 slash 16 slash 2023 ruling of the court dated 14th November 2023. All these were writs which invoked the original jurisdiction of the court to interpret the constitution. This court held that a violation of the rules nullified the proceedings. We also want to emphasize that by the decision of this court in the case of National Investment Bank number one versus Standard Offshore Trust Company number one reported in the 2017 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 707, the court held that where the provisions in the rules of court use the word shall, it is mandatory and should be enforced. We urge the court to follow these decisions. We should also add that where the irregularity complained about, complained about arises from originating proceedings, like in this particular matter, the court has also been consistent that such irregularities cannot be cured. So, several reasons why, in which recently the court has made the point, nullifying the rates. Secondly, the rules are mandatory, and the courts and the same court says that when they are mandatory, they will be enforced. 
and finally where the proceedings are originating in nature there can be no waiver there can be no waiver But that's the recent position of the court. What I was saying also, that even if it were curable, which it is not, the court's jurisdiction, substantive jurisdiction, to entertain the matter as a whole was not properly invoked. It was not, it, 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 it was not properly invoked because the court lacked jurisdiction to, to entertain the matter as a matter, the purpose of which is to determine whether or not the seat of a member of parliament is vacant. That matter belongs exclusively to the jurisdiction of the High Court. And this court has affirmed that consistently, not deviated in one, that if it has to do with the membership of a person in parliament, that belongs in the realm of the High Court, not this court. But I would want to emphasize the point that, admittedly, in every instance, they would say that the facts on the basis of which they are before this court arise, there will be a dispute between two people regarding whether or not the person properly is a member of parliament or not. And that has to be determined by reference to the constitutional provisions. It won't make it a dispute properly invoking the original jurisdiction of the court. What I'm saying is that wherever the question arises as to whether or not a person is properly a member of parliament, whether he ceases to be or he sees, I mean, his seat is vacant, there will be disputing positions, there will be differing positions, but the constitution says. Is the High Court that must determine that matter. And in this particular instance, the question is whether the parliamentarians who are the subject of the instant suit, their seats have become vacant. And the Constitution clarifies the position by telling the High Court the instances in which those seats will be deemed vacant. It's a cross carpeting situation. So it's a matter of evidence for the High Court to go into and find out whether the facts establishing those circumstances in Article 97 have arisen or not. It's not a question of interpretation. that the court had no jurisdiction to stay execution of the ruling of the first defendant. And that one, three main points will deal with that. First of all, the substantive suit before the court never challenged the ruling of the speaker. The, the suit before the court had nothing whatsoever to do with the ruling of the speaker. Interlocutory reliefs made by any court of the land relates to the substantive dispute before the court. That dispute was never before the court. And so, once the dispute was not before the court, the court didn't even have jurisdiction to make an interlocutory relief in respect of that ruling. Second, the High Court's ruling, uh, the, 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 the first defendant's ruling, is not a judicial decision which is properly the type of order or ruling which is the subject of the court's orders for stay of execution. At the very best, it's an administrative decision. It's not a judicial, it was not based on any judicial determination of any matter. Linked to that fact 
is the trite position that when we say stay of execution, we don't say it as a semantic expression, by way of semantics. It is based on the rules of the court. It's a statutory position that certain matters are liable to be progressed by way of what the law says, execution. And the law defines how to execute things. Not from anywhere, but from the judgment of courts. The speaker's ruling is not one of them. The speaker's ruling is not executable. It's not executable within the meaning of the rules that govern the practice before this court and any other court for that matter. That's, that's the third round. And the fourth round, let me make reference to the cases. Is that the processes The processes initiated for the process of the order, the ex parte application, was made in breach of the rules of national justice. And it's a rising reading for the rules of the High Court, which provide for applications because the rules of the don't provide extensively for their applications. And as I refer to order 19 of the rules of the High Court, which say clearly that every application must be made on notice. That's the first rule. There is an exception which allows for ex parte applications. Our submission is that. The, the, the rule, rule, uh, rule 3 of what the 19 talks about ex parte applications. And it says subject to rule 1, sub rule 3. That's of course, of An application by motion may be made ex parte where any of the rules provides, or where having regard to circumstances, the court considers it, considers it proper to permit the application to be made. Now, that's all. We should read the, the sub rules in context. The court may make an order ex parte on such terms and subject to such undertakings as it considers just, where it is satisfied that the delay caused by proceeding in the ordinary way would or might entail irreparable damage or serious mischief. Now, my lord. We are dealing with a plaintiff who has demonstrated that he's capable of getting the court to sit at very short hours. Mm. He files his ex parte application at 12.40. He gets a panel of the court to sit at 2. Our submission is that he should have made it on notice together with a motion for abatement of time. There was an intervening Monday before parliament would next sit. And the first defendant would at least have been given an opportunity on that Monday, however short it is, to make representation to the court on the, the grounds and basis for that application. And so that is the reason why we contend that the application itself did not properly come within the exception to the rule that he should have come on notice. Because it was always possible, given the, the facts of this case. On the basis of that, we further contend that the order of the court was also made in breach of the rules of natural justice. Because when it came before the court, within an hour and a half or so after it was filed, the court could have directed that the first defendant be put on notice to be heard on the coming Monday so that the facts will be properly put before the court to enable the court to reach a proper conclusion. We further submit also on another ground that the rules of court and practice did not permit the type of order that was given by the court. Bearing in mind the first rule again, as was expressed by the court in Barclays Bank and Ghana Cable, that ex parte Bear in mind the principles laid down by the court is of that. In the case of Barclays Bank and Ghana Cable, 1998-99, Supreme Court at page one, that ex parte applications and orders that flow from them are anomalies in our system. 
and all. In that particular case, the court emphasized that no ex parte order should be given pending the final determination of the matter. But that is what the court did in this particular instance. In fact, it's contrary to the rules of practice and the established decision of this court in Barclays Bank versus Ghana King. And we've also already made the point that since the, 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 the ruling of the speaker was not the matter that was before the court, the court couldn't have made an interlocutory order on the basis of the suit that was before the court. There was nothing before the court. Now we also note from the order that there was an application for just for stay of execution of the ruling of the court based on the writ that was filed before the court. And if my lords, the people of the court, if you take a look at the reliefs that were sought by the plaintiff, we realize that three members of parliament were listed. Hold on. Yes. When the rate is examined, it's not examined. It mentions three members three of parliament. Three members of parliament. The first of which is Honorable Andrew Asiamwa Amwako, who is now going to contest from the position of an NPP parliamentary candidate, no, from the position of an independent to NPP parliamentary candidate. His situation will be covered by Article 97 1 H of the 1992 Constitution. The reliefs that I see do not mention Article 97 1 H of the Constitution in the first relief. So an issue of interpretation is not sought for in respect of that particular relief. This is your submission. Yes. This is your view. That's, yes. Then, my laws will also realize that the reliefs don't cover honorable I've Peter. been alerted that you spent 16 minutes. Oh, really? <laughs> I'll be winding up, my lady. I'm, I'm sorry. They, 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 they will realize that the reliefs cover the honorable Peter, uh, Peter Yao Kwachi Aka, the NDC MP. You know, do not cover him. The reliefs of the substantive rate do not cover him, but the application covers him and the orders cover him. So on that ground, we say even the orders ex 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 exceeded the scope of the application and the nature of the suit. The, hold on, the scope of the application or the scope of the relief? The scope of the relief sought in the substantive uh, the substantive uh, uh, action. Uh -huh. Yes. And, and, on, and, and because it exceeded that, the application could not have been in respect of, of, of those, uh, the, the substantive suit. Unless we finally submit that because this matter was brought ex parte, the balance of convenience was not properly employed by the court, which is a ground upon which the court made this decision because of the fact that allegations were made about what was likely to happen in Parliament. And there was no foundation whatsoever for it. And so the cost uh, 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 to the section wasn't properly invoked, especially in respect of Articles 19, 13, which requires a fair year of constitutional right to be accorded to every person, and the provisions of 296A and B, which uh, 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 require the courts to um, exercise discretion. discretion in a particular manner. So we pray that there was every opportunity, and, 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 and the, the first panel would, would want to be heard on, on that. And for, just before I sit down, the hazard that was relied on, as we said, was not the official hazard. And we pray accordingly. Not, 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 not so. <laughs> not, not at all. I, 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 well, there are members of parliament, if they come in, can get up and say it is official, it's fine. They are. Do it with me.
Yes. Lord, with respect, we are vehemently opposed to the application. And we rely Mr. on... Mr. you have to hurry up. We would like to take your time. Very well. I, I, we, I always have to regulate Mr. Sorry because he tumbles his words out. But as for you, you pull them out. So now, Lord, don't try. pull them out like that. Very well, I'll try and speed up. <laughs> My Lord, with respect, we do so by relying on our affidavit in opposition file. May I find out whether Mr. Gatti has once again relinquished his privilege? <laughs> <laughs> My Lord, um, no. because, because uh, we will not allow you yeah. to argue half yeah. and leave half to Mr. Abedu. It will not happen. I, I, I appreciate that. My Lord. So, I, Abedu, I, have you really Mr. Abedu will argue this. Thank you. If the subsequently there's another matter. Thank you very ah, much. Mr. Abedu, please continue. Your 10 minutes are running. Lady, we oppose the application by relying on yeah, our. We oppose the application by relying on our affidavit in opposition filed on the 29th of October 2024. And we rely on all the depositions therein. Of notable concern to us is our paragraph 4, which is a counter to the contention by the first defendant applicant that the procedure adopted by us in is, commencing this action is questionable. Is this the affidavit of John Bosman? That is so, my lord. Go on. Lord, in doing so, we wish to advert the mind of the court to rules 45 and 46 of CI 16. which is a provision on procedure for invoking the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The rule provides that any such invocation shall be commenced by a writ and not an originating motion and we were accordingly guided. The rule further provides at order 46 that it must be accompanied by a statement of case. Rule 46. We're talking about rule 46 of CI system. Yes that it must be accompanied by a statement of case and my lord we accordingly complied my lord our second objection regards the nature of the reliefs sought by the plaintiff it has nothing to do with Article 99, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution. It was a plain and simple case of invocation of the original jurisdiction of this court for interpretation of Article 70, Article 97, Clause 1. G and H. And my Lord, we have painstakingly stated this in paragraph 10 of our affidavit in opposition, as well as 11. My Lord, our third ground of opposition is contained in paragraph 13 of our affidavit in opposition where we insist that the service of our writ and the motion or notice for interlocutory injunction 
on the Speaker of Parliament through the legal office of Parliament. Was good service. Was good service. Despite the fact that it was left on the table of the officer who received the processes. This was a day before the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament. It was done on the 16th of October 2024. And the Speaker went ahead to deliver his ruling on the 17th of October 2024. So our humble contention is that at the material time incidental to the delivery of the ruling, the speaker was fixed with knowledge of the pendency of the action before this honorable court. Yet he went ahead in this regard. <coughs> My Lord, our fourth ground can be found at paragraphs 18 and 19 of our affidavit in opposition. Where again we've taken the pain to state that the order of this honorable court on the 18th of October 2024 granting a stay of execution against the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament does not amount to any interference with the procedures and business of Parliament. May Lord spare Article 2 of the 92 Constitution. An invocation the exclusive original jurisdiction of this APS court is the right of every citizen of Ghana. The applicant in this instance is the majority leader and the leader of the majority caucus in parliament. He had an inherent interest in the said decision of the Speaker of Parliament, and for that matter, had every right, my Lord, to seek justice from this August Forum. But you know that under Article 2 actions, you don't even need to have an interest. Exactly. Your community of interest is with the Constitution of Ghana. Exactly. So, my Lord, the point we seek to make. Because that this point that you are making, I, I don't think it well. adds anything to this. Very well. So, Lord, we say that, guided by the Constitution, he need not show any interest. But even so, he had an interest. Lord, this is further fortified by Article 132 of the 1992 Constitution which vests this Honorable Court with authority with supervisory jurisdiction over any adjudicating authority any adjudicating authority in Ghana regardless of being a separate arm of government. Lord, our faith ground is contained in paragraph 21 and 22 of our affidavit in opposition. giving our justification for resorting to an ex-party application. 
paragraph, paragraph 21 and 22 of our agreement in opposition. Lord, we have stated therein that we could anticipate potential irreparable damage and mischief if the order was allowed to stay. And this action was to commence in the ordinary way. Lord, we fortified our submission by relying on order 25 to 8 of CI 47. Lord, they said order 25 to 8 identified Of CIF for the seek to make, the point we seek to make is that, my Lord, 1, this one, one, eight. Eight. 1, 8, very well, very well, my Lord, I'm um, 1, 8, very well, my Lord, and that's for the record, read it. <coughs> You don't have CI forty seven there, then can you move on? We've, we've, we've helped you by telling you order 25 rule 18, yes. not 25 8. So you can move on. Please, your time is up. Lord, what we intend saying over there is that there was an element of agency. There was an element of agency associated with the application and the need for a dispatch response. Moreover, any mischief achieved by the ruling of the speaker was irreparable, considering the fact that those four constituencies would have been bereft of representation in Parliament between now and its dissolution. Five of CI system. This honorable court is the only court of the land. CS with the power ceased with the power to prescribe rules of practice and procedure. So regardless of the fact that 
granting an ex parte application for limited number of days is not stated in the rules of the Supreme Court. My Lord, the court was all the same, vested with the power to make the order it made. And nothing, and nothing unlawful, unprocedural could be raised in respect of the order of the court. More so, my Lord, Article 2, Clause 2 of the 1992 Constitution gave this honorable power, this honorable court, the power to make appropriate directions that it may consider appropriate for giving effect or enabling effect to a declaration. My Lord, we are saying that in so long as those affected members of parliament were not given the opportunity to state their side of the story before the speaker made his order, the rules of natural justice, the order of Trump party was breached. was a statement made by a member on the floor of parliament. This was a statement made I, by I think you are going too far. Lord Amrandi. <coughs> this was a statement made by I think you are going too far. Very well. We can only limit ourselves to what is before us. Lord, the capacity of the plaintiff is questioned. It's you have you have responded to that. Yes, you, 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 very well. You said, um, with said if, if you don't mind, I can read what you said. Very well. I can read what you said. Um, The invocation of the jurisdiction of this court is the constitutional right of any citizen. Very well. Mm -hmm. to Article 2. Yes, my Lord, in that circumstance, then I crave your indulgence to round off my argument. So you are done? Yes, I'm rounding Thank off. you. That my Lord all said and done. All said and done. <laughs> my Lord all said and done. There are many people here who are not here because of this case. I know. Their work needs to get them. Yeah, I'm sorry. All said and done, it is the standpoint of the plenty respondent in this case that he has not breached any procedure in seeking the order which is now being sought to be set aside. Neither is his action in breach of any substantive law or the constitution governing the republic but granted without admission that there was even one rule 79 and order 81 <coughs> no rule 79 of ci 16 and and order 81 of ci 47 Lord, makes it curable by this honorable court. Lord, I rest my case. I'm grateful. And my Lord, whether executable or non-executable, an order of stay is made to operate. And Obrenu Kwesata versus Ghana Telecom is not far-fetched on this court. Which we are opposed to the application rely strictly on points of law. Before I proceed, may I respectfully 
announce a reconstitution of our representation. It will be joined by the Deputy Attorney General, Diana Asunabadapa. So it's a full house. The Office of the Attorney General is properly constituted. We submit that the instant application is offensive to the rules of procedure of this Honorable Court. It's unknown to the laws governing the jurisdiction of the court. The first point we make respectfully is that the Constitution has set out in clear terms the manner in which a challenge to the decision of the court can be made. This application completely violates the laid down procedure for challenging a decision of the court in the Constitution. Article 133, Clause 1. 133, Clause 1. Of the Constitution, first the Supreme Court with power to, and I quote, review any decision made or given by it on such grounds and subject to such conditions as may be prescribed by rules of court. Respectfully, the instant application seeks an order setting aside the process and proceedings of the court and vacating the order of the court. Respectfully, the decision in question was an exercise of right. Respectfully, as if you want to say, cross one. The review. One, three, three. <coughs> one three, three, I'm sorry. One, three, three. The review is on the court. Respectfully, my contention is that this provision is a rule under which a person aggrieved by a decision of the court comes by to seek a review of violation of the of decision. The instant application is not an application for review. It doesn't invoke the court's review powers. And is therefore unknown to the laws governing the judicial of the court. Especially Article 134 also vests the Supreme Court with the same powers of review of a teaching of a single justice. Indeed, the decision in question was not by a senior justice. But the point I seek to make is that whenever a decision of the court is being sought to be reviewed, varied or discharged, the procedure for doing so is as set out in the Constitution. And this is not an invocation of any of, the, of those procedures. So the second point we make is that the application mixes up grounds for a substantive defense to the action yes. <laughs> with matters that in the view of the first defendant constitutes a basis for a certain aside of the service. And this respectfully is wrong. The court will notice that on the face of the motion paper, the grounds for the application are stated as, and I respectfully, I'll put, I'll just be quick about it. The rate by which the plaintiff has reportedly invoked the court's original jurisdiction is incompetent. The court has no jurisdiction to detain the suit before the court. The court has no jurisdiction to say it's issue of a ruling of the Speaker of the Parliament of Ghana. Respectfully, paragraphs 12 to 18 of the affidavit in support also raise matters which constitute a substantive defense to the action. And I respectfully will quote paragraph 12. So the words used in Article 97, Clause 1, paragraphs J and H of the Constitution are clear, unambiguous, and have no undisputed, have no disputed meaning, and no basis exists in the process as far as assuming that there's dispute. Then paragraph 13. Is that the words used in the provisions of Article 97, Clause 1, paragraphs J and H simply mean what they say. That is to say, when a member of parliament leaves a party on the ticket officially elected to parliament to join a political party or to become an independent member of parliament, or when a member of parliament elected as an independent member of parliament joins a political party, they shall vacate their seat. 
Mr. I will turn over to paragraph 29 to 32 of the affidavit in support. And again, they constitute substantive defenses to the action. I'm not attorney general, you know you have 10 minutes. Yes, please. My, my lady, I'm so well within the term, I'm sorry. So, it says, paragraph 31, further, the 19th Constitution of the Republic of Ghana provides for the world no separation of powers doctrine, whereby the scope of the powers of each arm of government is set out, and no arm of government is set, is, is, is expected to accept its bounds. The same is repeated in another part today on the affidavit. So, the point I make respectfully is that when a defendant takes the view that the writ does not invoke the decision of the court because in the view of the defendant, the words of the constitution are clear. The rules do not permit the filing of an application to set aside the race on that basis. Indeed, the grounds for such a contention will have to be in a statement of case filed at the point raised for determination by the court. And the court will notice that indeed that issue is actually one of the issues set out set out by the second defendant for determination. The second defendant does the attorney general file issues for determination in this matter, and those are issues raised in the for determination by the court. Respectfully, indeed, the application completely misunderstands and misconceives the Supreme Court's original judicial. And I made the point that Indeed, the court would notice that Article 2, Clause 1 of the Constitution constitutes the principal mechanism, with all respect, for enforcing the, the Constitution. And in examining Article 2, Clause 1, I pray the court not to look only at the article, but to even read it with Article 3, Clause 1 of the Constitution. Article 3 of the Constitution, Article 3, the whole of Article 3 of the Constitution, imposes a duty on all citizens to defend the constitution at all times. Respectfully, there is no better mechanism for defending the constitution by seeking an interpretation of the constitution whenever a provision of the constitution is in contention or a controversy has arisen in respect of that provision. Clearly, The meaning of Article 97, Clause 1, Paragraphs J and H, as advanced by my late friend, Counsel for Defense Fenat, and which he says are clear, have been contradicted by the plaintiff in this case. And indeed, I have also duly filed a single case in, in it. And totally, his understanding, with all respect, is wrong. There cannot be a more demonstrable case for a controversy as having arisen in respect of a provision of the constitution than the instant case. But indeed, my respectful submission is that indeed it will be a recipe for chaos, lawlessness, and a danger to the security of the state for a person to contend that merely on account of his own understanding of the constitution, which he says are clear, a rich issued duly invoking the decision of the Supreme Court has to be set aside. And that would be the basis for lawless conduct. And this honorable court owes a duty not to encourage it. Maybe I'm fortified in this proposition by the locus classicus on the matter to four and attain Jura, reported in 1980, Ghana Report, at page 637. It is where the Supreme Court stated clearly that whenever a controversy has arisen in respect of a provision of the Constitution, it is a basis for the implication of the cause of original reason. Respectfully, the points I make today are not points being sought to be established today. They are matters that have been long established 40 years ago in this Honorable Court. My lady, I quote at a quote from page. 650 of the provision. And indeed, it was also a controversy regarding a decision by Parliament. Parliament had actually made a decision to subject the Chief Justice of the Republic to vote. The Chief Justice had also even acceded to that process. The Supreme Court said that, notwithstanding the Chief Justice's decision, 
If so far as that decision was unconstitutional, it could form the side matter of the original decision of the Supreme Court. But it is the court stated that there is a controversy regarding the status of the incumbent chief justice, the termination of which depends upon our interpretation of the constitution. Once there is a controversy, a justiciable issue, we believe that under the wing of interpretation as contained in paragraph A of clause 1 of article 118, the court has reason to detain the issue raised by the plaintiff's right, and the plaintiff is thus properly before the court. And respectfully, the court went ahead to make the point that in the constitutional action, the community of interest is with the constitution. There is even no such thing as a plaintiff and a defendant, and therefore um, the, the right which mentioned some um, um, members of parliament there must be a demonstration of an interest in them. There's no certain as that. Indeed, the plaintiff, with all respect, could have omitted reference to any member of parliament and have just stated a question for determination by the court, whether upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 97, Clause 1, Paragraphs J and H of the Constitution, a, a seat of a member of parliament becomes vacant upon the occurrence of A and B. And that is it. And the court would have been seized with the administration. My lady, the first final makes reference to an alleged denial of the right to a hearing. I'll do a time for Patem by the final of Moshe's party. My respectful quick answer is that indeed, for me to say that Moshe's party submission is totally incongruous, totally offensive to the long of the eight-fold parties in this report. Respectfully, I would respond to the contention made by my learned friend that there was an understanding of the CJ with the Speaker of Parliament and all that. I will not seek to even go into the merits of the understanding. But the no, point was made that positionally. No, hold on, please. Right. I, I think that for the benefit of the public, public right. of this nation, right. it is important to address the facts behind that, one. that matter. Right. SBB. D. Because <coughs> there had been a circular in 2021. to regulate service of members of parliament. And indeed, the Speaker of Parliament invited me as Chief Justice to discuss the return to that regulation. So I reviewed what my predecessor did, and I issued a circular. If anything, I think your submissions may address the import, the oh, legal yes. import, oh, and yes. nothing more. Right. Maybe in addressing the legal import of, of that secular, I would note respectfully that I'm just looking for a secular, that what is paramount before the court in an action of this nature is the proper interpretation of the constitution. And indeed, as held into foreign Nigeria, even if, assuming with her admitting, even if the CG had written such a letter, for me, with all respect, it's immaterial. It's a secular. The secular, written such a secular, it is immaterial for me. It is a construction of the words in the constitution that matter. The foreign general even indicated that the chief justice who had lent himself to the process, which was subsequently pronounced upon as unconstitutional by, by, by the court, could not have waived any right whatsoever. Because there's no certain as a super under the constitution. And I did I look at the provisions, the words in article articles 117 and 118. <coughs> All it says is that civil or criminal processes 
coming from any court or place, as of Parliament, shall not be served on or executed in relation to the Speaker or a member of the, of the, of the clerk of Parliament while he is on his way to attending acts or returning from any proceedings of Parliament. In my respect to you, I do not see Monday in Article 117. I do not see Monday there. I do not see Tuesdays to Friday. I do not see <laughs> all that must be understood clearly. Irrespective of that secular, in my respect to you, I, the Atejira, can, or any citizen of the land, having in voted on the Supreme Court, can serve the process on a member of parliament, a speaker of parliament, or a clerk to parliament, except when he's on his way to parliament or returning from parliament. That's what he says. <coughs> but it, again, there is an attempt to suggest, and it, is, it was implied in the submissions relating to the Supreme Court overstepping its bounds and whatever you, that Parliament of Ghana, I, I don't have a right of reply, but it's here. It's now over 25 minutes. Yeah. Let me let it check. Attorney General, and I, you have one, one minute left. But, but I don't have a right to reply, especially that he got up only on points of law. So I will, I will but, but he's exceeding. Please sit down. Yes. 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 yes, the point of law I made it because of application. Please, please, please don't waste your one minute. Maybe, I'm Maybe the point I'm making is that the Supreme Court's judicial review powers, first one to articles 2 cross 1 and 130 cross 1, <laughs> extend to any authority, institution of state, or any individual in the country. No arm of government, no institution of state, and definitely no individual is exempt from it. Indeed, the president himself is even subject to the Supreme Court's judicial review powers under the Constitution. And the Constitution spells out the consequences for a failure to obey decisions and orders and directives of the Supreme Court. That is in Article 2, Clause 4. Failure to obey or carry out the terms of an order or direction made or given under Clause 2 of this article constitutes a high command under this Constitution and shall, in the case of the president to advise, then constitute a ground for removal from office under this constitution. So, so clearly, the powers of the court can never be questioned at all. And it is for this reason that the Supreme Court in to follow an attain Jira and further fortified by J. H. Mesa and Atain reported in 1996, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, stated clearly that in Ghana there's even no such thing as a political person. The court can call into question any act or omission of any person at all, insofar as it's in violation of the constitution. So the, 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 the contention by my friend, counsel for fair defendants, that it was administrative decision of the, of the speaker. And so with all respect, I'll ask, and so what? <laughs> any administrative decision of a person or authority which comes in contravention of the constitution is amenable to the court's judicial review powers. I certainly submit that the application before you is totally offensive to all rules and procedure of this honorable court. It's unknown to the laws of Ghana and must be dismissed. I pray accordingly. I will just. Some short points of law, especially that they were made of points of law, and then I'll be very short. First point that the application is unknown to any rule of procedure and offensive and all of that. First, the simple answer. Since the days of Mosi and Bajina, elementary, first rule in the civil procedure class is that if an order is a nullity, you can come by any procedure to set it aside. It remains the law following from, that he, he likes to cite cases of vintage, he says over 40 years. She calculate when Mosi and Bajina was, was, was decided, 1963. Mr. Sorry, all your juniors are here. And they were here when they said uh, 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 it's a misconception and a misunderstanding. They have remained here. Mm. And this is the clearest example of a misconception and misunderstanding. I said from 1963 up to 2000, and we are now in 2020 something. It remains the law, elementary first rule. Two, that I'm challenging the jurisdiction of the courts, and I'm saying uh, with, uh, with all due respect, some matters. I don't fall within the jurisdiction. Some matters do not. That, that this matter doesn't fall within the jurisdiction of the court, mm. and that should, I'm mixing mm. a, 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 a matters that should go through the defense mm. and then an objection. Mm -hmm. Now, the rule. point made. Yes. 
is that if you are urging that the rate is incompetent, yes. that should be separated yes. from submitting a defense to the substantive action. Perfect. That's one. Yes. Second, that if this court gives an order and you wish for it to be vacated, reversed, varied, discharged, the onus is on you to bring an application under the review jurisdiction Perfect. of the court Perfect. and not an application such as you have crafted. Yes, that's the point. And I'm saying that the trite principle of civil procedure is that the rules of review aside, this court delivers judgment according to three main yardsticks statute law, common law, and the well known practice of the courts. That has been consistent. And the well known practice of the court and the common law is that you come and set it aside. And I'm saying way back from the I mean, up to date, that remains law. So this is not a, a point. Secondly, if I am challenging the jurisdiction of the court, there are two ways, and several ways, elementary civil procedure. I can take it in limine or put it in my defense. And I'm taking it in limine. Another elementary point. Now, let me just deal with the Article 21 point, tenderly said. In all of the cases involving Article 99, the jurisdiction of the court to determine a membership of parliament, they also come under Article 21. But the court has always said that, yes, if they didn't invoke Article 21, they wouldn't have been here. But the court has said, look, we will keep our streams clear. Then you cite to for an attorney general and uh, about the fact that the matter is within your one minute is up <laughs> well there are other cases more of the recent vintage they all say clearly that that would not be a reason for the court to entertain the decision that's for the secular the, 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 my lord the, my lord the chief justice must have had reason to issue it and the speaker must have had reason to respect it and, and if it, it has constitutional power. if it's not constitutional he knows what to do he should come and declare it unconstitutional but otherwise then the speaker should feel deceived by it. That is the point. You are done. I'm done. But if my time was happening. The case is stood down for the court to rule. All rise.
It's been a very interesting morning, particularly Absolutely. for the...